tell you of Ruth, it's actually someone that has a lot of experience and you're going to enjoy it today. Our goal at AOA is to help you make and or keep more money than ever before. We, we are here and um, in so many different ways, you'll see a list of benefits that we provide for our members. We are a membership and that's over 20,000 strong. And there's a lot of things that we like to do for you. And today, I uh, just want to bring attention to the fact that we did update our website. And it's been a long time coming. And with that, uh, what we want you to know is that we are here for the future. And we are preparing for the future. We realize that many of you are going through a digital transformation. And we are also, we want to be a part of that with you. And we have... Uh, forms, we have magazines, we have all kinds of things to help you, to give you ideas, and it's, that's what you need. You, you need ideas, you need to be in contact with the right people, so we're here to help facilitate that. And anyway, I would like, let's see, so yes, we have a e-newsletter that I want to invite you to subscribe to. We wouldn't want you to miss out on anything, whether it's a, a law update for your landlord-tenant law, or whether it's a, a uh, announcement for another live stream. And if you're on the web page, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, on the right side, you'll see a place there for you to put, put in your name and email address and zip code. And if you send that off to us, then we'll send you uh, updates when it's appropriate. <coughs> and also, if you're, you're tuning in for the first time, if you haven't subscribed to the AOA USA channel, uh, you can go ahead and hit the subscribe button, and then also you can take that, that little notification bell and activate it so that you can get notified every time that we go live, and then that way you won't miss anything. And at least it's there. It's always there for you. You can go back and, and look at things if you have to, when you have to get back to work. And anyway, it's... Uh, it's real today's event is brought to you by AD Magellan and they are what they are not they are not a construction company but they are a consulting company and they do inspections planning and management of the construction process so they're there to help you and um, to kind of hold accountable the different people that are actually doing the work and ensure that you get your warranties taken care of. And um, anyway, so they are a, a great resource and an advocate for you. That's who's putting this on today. And the one of the, the founders and partners at AD Magellan is our speaker today. And so I want to introduce him. He has 15 years. He worked for a, a large company um, that oversees the management process. And, and so 15 years he did that, and then he came out on his own, and they've been working for the last five years with A.D. Magellan. You can visit them on their website, and I took a look at that. They have a great website. Uh, you won't find any negative Yelp reviews for them, but you can ask them for a list of, uh, of satisfied clients, and they can provide that for you. And anyway, so it's my pleasure. He's an, he's, he's an expert witness for defect attorneys, and he has just a tremendous amount of expertise. And um, I think it's, it'll be really, he'll, this really will, I believe this really lines up with our goal to help you save or keep more money than ever before. He'll help you make sure that your warranty is actually going to work for you if, you if you ever have to use that with your roof. Anyway, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Paul Reyes. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I'll tell you in advance, we usually cover most of this over the course of an hour. So if I'm uh, moving through this very quickly, I apologize, but the goal is to get as much in here in 20 minutes uh, as possible. And then I'm happy to spend uh, as much time afterwards uh, answering any questions. Uh, so here is our uh, objective today, just kind of talking about different roof, roof types, uh, reasons that we typically see those roof types uh, fail, some of the things that we can do to try and prolong uh, roof life. And then once we move over into the stage of needing to re-roof, uh, you know, what are some of the uh, 
uh, clear paths to success that we can uh, help you identify and kind of get through that whole process. So <clears throat> we'll, we'll start out with slope roofs and you can see in the picture here to the right uh, that uh, we've got uh, kind of a traditional building paper um, on this roof. And so this is, there's a couple of different types of paper out there now, lots of synthetics, but traditionally what folks have used over the course of the years is this building paper, uh, which is a minimum of 15 pounds. That's what most cities and counties um, are requiring uh, to meet code. And uh, part of that is also, um, you know, just putting one layer of this paper down. Well, unfortunately, uh, what happens is they'll put, you know, the roofers will put one layer of this uh, 15 pound paper and when I say pound, it's kind of similar to the paper that you would use, you know, in your printer. So you've got the really, really thin stuff, and then you've got thicker cardstock as that poundage goes up. Um, so they put this paper down, and once the paper's down, then they load the roofs with either tile or composition shingle. And so you've got roofers that are walking back and forth on this paper, dropping tools, dropping uh, the actual material on it. And so unfortunately, most of the time before the actual roofing um, component goes down, this paper has already been compromised. Uh, and it's very unfortunate because this paper is your primary uh, uh, kind of defender against uh, water getting into your building. And so in, in, in addition to that damaged paper now, you know, we'll see folks kind of moving along because the guys up on the roof you know, their boss told them to have this roof done by Friday. Uh, and so, you know, the attention to detail um, at, uh, you know, some of the chimneys and valleys and that sort of thing um, isn't always there at the beginning. And unfortunately, as an owner, you won't know that, um, assuming, of course, you don't get up on the roof. Uh, you know, you won't know that for uh, potentially years. So, you know, our, our objective right out of the gate on a re-roof would be to put down two layers of paper. So you've got your primary and then your secondary, which, you know, let the guys walk on that, load the roofs. And if it gets torn a little bit, it's not a big deal because you've got your second layer underneath there. And you're spending maybe another three, four cents on the dollar uh, to do that. As I mentioned, there's also some, some synthetic options uh, available that are stronger and more resistant to damage as well. So once we get the composition shingle, uh, in this case, uh, up on this roof, um, you know, your, your primary defender there uh, against um, a failure is those little rock granules that if you've ever looked closely at a, at a composition shingle roof, there's the little rock granules that will give you your color. Um, but what they're also there to do is to protect the uh, oil-based shingle itself from UV. So over the years, whether it's wind, rain, depending on the quality of the shingle to begin with, those little rock granules will slowly be, you know, start to, to uh, wash off of the roof. And when that happens, now the UV is able to kind of work its magic on the shingle itself and start deteriorating that at a, at a rapid rate. Uh, you can see here, I've kind of circled a few things. It's probably difficult uh, you know, on, on the screen, but you know, when people go up and do maintenance, the, the picture over here to the right, you know, someone just went up and put a, a regular nail uh, you know, in that um, a B vent sleeve, which you, know, you don't want, you've actually just created more of an issue there uh, as opposed to just leaving it alone. We've got unsealed penetrations um, there. And so, you know, if you, if you take the time to properly maintain a roof, you know, you should, if you do it right to begin with, and then you maintain it, you should be able to get 50 plus years out of these roofs. I mean, it's just, it's really unfortunate that, uh, you know, I'll speak primarily about the West Coast um, because most of my experience is from kind of Colorado West. You know, to, to only get 20, 25, 30 years out of a roof is really sad. Uh, you know, I mean, over in Europe, they get 100 years out of a roof on a regular basis. Um, and, you know, you have to spend a little bit more on the front end, but, uh, you know, then you don't have to re-roof this thing, 
you know, all, all the time. You can see over here, the picture to the left, um, there's actually some, some organic growth uh, on that roof. So that's another thing that leads to deterioration. Um, and, and that again can, you know, if it's properly maintained, because depending on the orientation of your roof, uh, you know, if you're in, in the shade and you've got a lot of moisture, uh, it's likely that you'll see some of that organic growth, but there's solutions out there that are biodegradable and non-toxic that you can use to kind of keep those things clean because what happens is that organic growth starts to attach itself to those rocks and then you get a decent rain event and then it just washes off swaths uh, of, of that rock, uh, shortening the, the life of your roof. So here, uh, this is a tile roof and I've just got a, a few arrows pointing out um, areas that we typically see uh, as intrusion issues. So, you know, assuming that the paper out in the field, meaning those big flat areas, is all done properly, you know, we've got behind chimneys uh, where we see improper lapping a lot of times, that usually uh, is a failure point. Uh, the second arrow down is pointing out a valley and what we like to see, particularly on tile roofs, and especially if you've got kind of an S-tile roof, is you know, we wanna see a six to eight inch uh, valley there. Uh, and so that way any you know, leaves, pine needles and debris that works its way onto the roof uh, you know, is easily washed right down and off of that roof. If you've got tiles that are butted right up against each other, now it allows all those debris to accumulate. And then when you get rain, uh, it can form a little uh, bird bath and then push the water back up underneath the paper. Um, there was one thing I didn't touch on on that first, first uh, slide. You know, we, we typically like to see at least a 12 to 18 inch overlap on that paper. So in the case of let's say a bird bath or even a strong wind event where it's blowing rain kind of back up underneath your roof, we want that water to work really hard making its way up a foot or more before it can get into the building. What we see oftentimes is maybe a five to six inch overlap. Uh, and that's again, just, you know, the guys aren't trying to do anything wrong, but they're hustling. They're trying to stretch materials, um, you know, as far as possible. So we wanna see proper overlaps and penetration seals to help prevent issues uh, on sloped roofs like that. So moving to flat roofs, uh, you know, UV is, again, another uh, major culprit here, assuming that the roof was done, um, you know, correctly to begin with. Uh, that adhesion failure is what we see next, and I'll kind of, I'll talk about some roof types here in the next slide. Um, you know, but most of our older roofs are what's called a modified bitumen, where it's an oil-based product uh, that, again, has that, the rock on top of it uh, to, to keep the UV off of it. Well, if those seams were not sealed properly when that roof went down, they're going to start to separate and then that allows moisture to make its way uh, into your roof. And then of course, you know, depending on the type of roof that you've got, you know, and the amount of traffic, uh, you know, up there, if you've got, you know, uh, heating and AC units and uh, even, you know, we see a lot of plumbing and electrical. So if you've got folks up there on a regular basis, damage is, going to occur, you know, ju just as a result of, of that. Uh, and so, you know, we always look for proper walk paths and to protect the roof, uh, you know, as best as possible. So here, here's kind of the, the, the four that we, that we typically see. We've got the modified bitumen up in the upper right-hand corner and the built-up roofing down on the left. So if you've been up on any of your roofs that have been built, you know, in the last 30, 40 years, this is what you'll typically see. This is what you know, uh, most builders were putting on roofs up until the past few years when we started to have to meet uh, what's called Title 24 here in California requirements. So uh, the Title 24 is a requirement to basically uh, reflect as much energy out, uh, back up off of the building. And so you, you'll see the PVC and TPO over here in the left-hand corner being put down to meet those Title 24 uh, requirements. Now, unfortunately, one of the things that we have seen is, you know, the buildings that were built, uh, you know, 70s, 80s, even into the 90s, um, and designed for a built-up or a modified bitumen roof, 
those roofs breathe differently than a roof that's designed to take a PVC or a TPO roof. So you think about taking a, a glass of water and putting saran wrap on it and then putting it out in the sun and you're gonna get a ton of moisture built up underneath that saran wrap. Um, we've gotta be really careful that we don't end up with that when we're putting a PVC or TPO roof on a, a roof membrane on an older roof. Uh, these modified bitumen roofs and the built up roofs, they breathe differently and so we, we've actually started to see uh, some construction defect issues with uh, you know, a PVC TPO that was put down that wasn't vented properly. And it's a, it's a weird situation because typically you know your roof is failing if you start getting water leaks. Um, but in this case, you know, your roof could be failing uh, in, the, in the form of water or moisture building up on the underside of that plywood or OSB and you won't know it until you know someone starts uh, walking around on that roof and everything is soft. Uh, at which point, you know, you're looking at uh, major, uh, major repairs uh, because all of that deck sheeting is going to have to come off, and you might even have some structural repairs as well. So the the rejuvenation down in the bottom right hand corner uh, is an option depending on the type of roof. You know, where we can go down with a coating over an existing, let's say, modified bitumen or a built-up roof. Uh, and there's a, a, a variety of, of different coatings out there. Um, and it can be a really good uh, solution. You can get anywhere from, you know, 10 to 20 year warranties on those. Uh, it just depends on, you know, all the factors, um, you know, in that, in that roof uh, that you're looking at there. So, Here's a few examples of failure points that we see. Uh, the bottom left-hand corner, this is a TPO roof, and you can see that that seam was not welded properly. One thing to keep an eye out on is, you know, TPO and PVC roofs look really identical if you're looking at them side to side. Uh, the PVC roof actually has a higher uh, melting point. So when you're, uh, they, they have these little, it almost looks like a, a little heating lawnmower that goes along these seams. Well, you have to heat PVC higher to get your adhesion than you do with TPO. And so, you know, we've been up on roofs where the guys are installing this brand new PVC roof. All of the seams are not holding because they had the temperature set for a TPO. Um, so that's something that you've got to look out for over here on the right hand side, you can see the adhesion failure going up this parapet wall and then also the parapet cap is not properly sealed. So this is another area where when we see folks uh, either repairing roofs or scoping out for a new roof, um, they kind of, they'll stop the roof at the roof itself. We need to be very cognizant about both that vertical wall, your parapet, and even what's on the other side of that wall. You know, if it's stucco on the back side, but it's, you know, uh, 30 years old, it's likely that the paper behind that stucco is also deteriorated. So you, you, know, you, you don't wanna spend all this money getting your brand new roof only for moisture be able to, to be able to make its way in through that stucco wall and get underneath your brand new roof. Um, because of course that, you know, the roofer will say, well, that wasn't our, wasn't our fault, uh, but now you spent all this money on a brand new roof and you've got water getting in there. Uh, the last picture up in the upper left-hand corner, you can see some, you know, someone came in and tried to fix some seams uh, with you know, some Henry's and then someone came in later on and tried to put some silicone over it. And it's just a, a recipe for disaster there. So the, the old fashioned way of figuring out whether or not you need a new roof you know, is one, are we getting any leaks? Two, let's get up on the roof and take a look at it. You know, are, are the granules all gone? Uh, when we walk around and we're bouncing up and down, do we feel some soft spots? And, you know, that's, that, that was the best that we could do. Uh, you know, of course, we're taking some core samples as well. But what we've started utilizing this past couple of years is thermal technology um, on drones. And so now we've got the ability to go scan a roof and pick up any moisture that is trapped underneath that membrane. So this is great because it opens up a whole new world for us when we're specking uh, a new roof on what we can or can't do. 
uh, you know, we've been up on roofs where it looked like it was end of life. I mean, the roofs look horrible. We scanned it and it was dry as a bone underneath there. So, uh, you know, in that case, they only had one layer of roofing. We actually went with a coating uh, to buy them 20 years because they also didn't want to spend any money on the roof at the time, as opposed to maybe the old way of doing it would have been like, well, we've got to, you know, put a new roof on this or, or um, um, you know, take another option. So uh, it also allows us to pinpoint areas that do have issues. So, you know, in this case, if we're going into winter, you know, we might say, hey, look, rather than trying to tackle the whole roof, let's just tackle this, you know, small little 140 square foot section to get you through this winter uh, while we figure out, you know, what else we need to do. Um, you know, this is a, a, another sample of, you know, once we see, especially in that bottom uh, picture, we see that much moisture underneath the roof. Uh, and, and I know it's hard because we can't zoom in, but this roof actually didn't look that bad when we were up there. Um, seeing all of this moisture, you know, allowed us to make the proper recommendation to this uh, client and set expectations appropriately for contingency. Because when we see this much water underneath the roof, we know we're going to have to get into plywood, maybe even, you know, sister, um, some structural components. Um, you know, as well. And actually part of the parapets that I had mentioned earlier were one of the big issues on this particular uh, building. So it's nice because, you know, if we're, we're going into a rainy season using this type of technology, it's easier to give, you know, either a clean bill of health or, oh, let's just tackle this one area, um, you know, for repair or even prioritize buildings. You know, if we've got, you know, 10 different buildings, and they all were re-roofed about the same time, you know, 30-ish years ago, you know, we can go up and scan them and say, hey, look, let's start with building A and F this year. And then in 2022, we'll do B and C or, or what have you. So it's, uh, it's a pretty phenomenal tool. Uh, and I would recommend to everybody that, um, you know, you, you, you try and take advantage of that technology. Um, and so, you know, if you've got a roof that's already leaking, it's similar to waiting until your tooth is killing you and then going to the dentist. Uh, you know, if, if, if it gets to that point now, maybe you're looking at root canal. Uh, and so if, if it's currently leaking, you, you really want to step back and look at, you know, what you should be doing on those roofs. Um, you know, we see a lot of folks um, just kind of spending money on really expensive band-aids uh, year after year after year, as opposed to kind of stepping back and looking at, you know, the project phasing sometimes, or not sometimes, a lot of times these days, you know, we're utilizing when, you know, folks don't want to, you know, spend all that money, uh, you know, at once. And then we just, we want to look, you know, one to five years out, uh, you know, when we're looking at these things so that you can appropriately plan financially, um, you know, on how to tackle uh, these, these types of situation. So, uh, you know, I, I recommend whether it's our firm or another qualified firm that you get someone uh, involved that can really lay out all of the different options that you have available to you for addressing your roof issue, because there's always at least two, if not more options. And depending on where that owner is, uh, you know, in the property, are they holding it long term? Are they looking to flip it in the next year or two? Uh, do they want to burn a bunch of cash before uh, the end of the year or the end of the quarter or what? You know, we want to provide all of those options and the pros and cons to each one of those, um, you know, uh, to, to you and the owners. And that includes gathering all the data, you know, from on-site folks of, oh yeah, we always have issues with building A. Um, but then we, we uh, develop that proper scope of work bid to the appropriate contractor. And when I say that, I mean, like we've got folks that we will bid out uh, specifically if it's a sloped roof. Uh, and those might not be the same guys that we would have go do a flat PVC roof. Uh, and so not all roofers are, are created equal. And then lastly, tying these roofers into uh, the warranty, uh, the manufacturer sign off, uh, schedule, you know, I, I had mentioned to Jeff um, before this started that, you know, unfortunately, most of our clients out there, uh, well, clients now, 
uh, that didn't involve us early on, you know, think they have a manufacturer's warranty on a roof and they don't. Uh, you know, you've got these billion dollar uh, manufacturers out there that have really expensive attorneys writing their get out of jail free card um, for warranties. And so, you know, a lot of them will require inspections during the uh, re-roof. And if you don't call for those, which they're free, um, then you have no warranty. Um, and so your only option, you know, if the roof fails is to sue the roofer and try to sue the manufacturer, but, you know, you likely won't get anything out of them. Um, so I, I hope I haven't gone too far over my time here. Um, you know, em emergency repairs, uh, we really hate to see folks um, in a situation like that. And if you are in an emergency repair situation right now, um, you know, call someone in to, uh, you know, develop kind of a roadmap uh, for you for, you know, how you can tackle those roofs moving forward. You know, a proactive approach, like I said, if we're looking years down the road, um, is, is really a, an awesome way to go. And even, you know, from uh, keeping yourself in, in a driver's seat and negotiating with your contractors, you know, contractors love to, if you can sign a contract with them now for next year, uh, they'll secure the manufacturer's pricing and, you know, they'll negotiate with you as opposed to if you want to start a project right now, we just had some rains here in Southern California, uh, you know, they're busy. Um, and so you're going to pay more for that. Um, I had mentioned the, uh, the thermal scans, uh, anything you can do. Unfortunately, that doesn't work um, on uh, um, sloped roofs as well, um, but on flat roofs or even some waterproofing um, decks, uh, we can utilize uh, that type of technology. And I think that's it. Great, thank you so much. Paul, that was really, really good stuff. I like that thermal imaging. I think that that sounds like that'll be a money saver for a lot of people. Really and uh, could you tell us where, what area you serve? Yeah, we cover it from San Diego up to San Francisco currently. Okay. Okay. All right. And um, hold on one second. So we, we do have some questions here. So I'll go ahead and ask one. Let me see. Oh, and um, go ahead and stop sharing your screen. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. <laughs> Great, now we can see your beautiful face, your handsome face, here we are. So we have, um, so yeah, that was the one question I did wanna ask so that people know where you're at and that really this, all the way up to San Francisco, all the way down to San Diego, mm -hmm. um, that you have access there. And we have on YouTube, there's from, from Hermosa property. And do you recommend coating to flat roofs for longer life and to reflect the heat in the summers? Yeah, so coating can be a really good option. Uh, it depends on the existing condition uh, of the roof. So we don't want to coat or even put an overlay, like a, a new um, layer of roofing over a roof if we know that there's moisture uh, underneath the existing membrane already. Um, but it can be, the coatings can be a very cost effective way to buy yourself 10, 20 years. Uh, depending on the type of coating, it can definitely add insulation. Uh, you know, there's um, Tropical is one that's coming to mind right now where you can put that stuff down and build it up to make it thicker in certain areas so we can, can even kind of help from a drainage standpoint to shed water off of the roof, add insulation, and then give yourself a good um, coating. But there's a lot of things that need to be taken into consideration before you do a coat because um, there's, you know, there's silicone, there's some others that are more breathable. And so we just want to make sure that that's the right um, product for the right roof. Um, so if you're in Hermosa Beach, you know, depending on how close you are to the water uh, too, you know, that's a little bit more corrosive environment than if we're further inland. So just all things to consider. Right. And how do you guys exactly fit in? So let's say they have a roofer that they're wanting to use, someone that they used you know, for other projects that, that they were happy with. How do you fit into that? 
So, uh, you know, we would come in and look at the type of uh, the scope of work that that roofer mm -hmm. uh, is proposing. And, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a great scope of work and we don't really need to change much on that end. Uh, usually there's some tweaking that we'll, you know, um, we'll make to make sure that it's the, the, the perfect scope for that um, product. And then, you know, once the roofer is contracted, we like to, you know, get up on those roofs at least once a week to make sure that the product is being put down per manufacturer specs and, you know, there aren't any mistakes uh, being made. I mean, especially when it comes to coatings, um, you know, you, we find quite often there are uh, teams of roofers that are used to putting down, you know, one type of coating uh, and a different type of spec for this one, but those guys come over and they start putting it down the same way that this one would go down when meanwhile, this one actually has different dry times or, you know, this one we can't put uh, down if humidity is at a certain level. And so, you know, we, we, we try to work with that roofer as part of the team to protect the owner's interest and make sure that they're getting what they pay for. And then if there is a change order, uh, which they're, you know, usually are, uh, you know, we can review that um, on behalf of the owner to say, hey, look, this is legitimate. We do actually need to do this. Um, you know, and sometimes often we're, we're uh, you know, if we get involved after the fact, you know, we're recommending change orders, you know, so for example, if they're replacing some metal and you're on Herm in Hermosa Beach down close to the coast and they were using a light gauge uh, galvanized that we know is going to deteriorate in two or three years, you know, we'll go in and say, look, you guys should be using something different. Uh, otherwise, you'll, your roof will still be in good shape in two or three years, but all this metal is going to be gone. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sounds like maybe some of the, uh, the roofers might like you as well, because they end up having a more expensive job to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the, the goal is actually, you know, we want to maintain good relationships with our roofers. And we, we really try hard to work just with really good roofers and guys that want to do the right thing for that roof. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and so there's, you know, there's some owners there where, uh, you know, like we don't want to spend an extra dime. Okay, if you don't want to spend an extra dime, that's fine. It's your roof. We just want you to be fully aware of what may happen because you're not choosing to spend, you know, that that extra dime. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and so in some cases, it it might not make sense. You know, you're you're gonna you're gonna do a, a complete revamp of that property in five years. Uh, okay, look, let's let's do something that buys us five years. Uh, no sense mm -hmm. in spending you know, good money now and having to rip it all up in five years for your, for your remote. Right. Here we go. From YouTube, we have Lou. We recently got several bids on a roof in San Diego. One of the companies suggested ridge venting across the whole roof instead of the flat vents that everyone uses, which mm -hmm. is better. <laughs> so again, this comes down to the, the, um, the design of the roof. And so what I would do there, assuming we're not uh, going to get involved, is uh, look at the uh, product that those roofers are specking. So which manufacturer um, is providing those ridge vents and reach out to that manufacturer and have them tell you the pros of using their product versus, and then reach out to the other manufacturer uh, and have them tell you the pros of using their product because sometimes depending on the pitch of the roof, uh, you know, we'll spec one over the other. Um, but I'd say for sure you want that manufacturer's complete and total buy-in for um, the product and and even the, the roofer that's going to be, you know, installing it. So I would encourage you to, you know, let's say it's a, it's a GAF, um, you know, call the GAF rep and say, okay, uh, XYZ roofer is recommending this product with the ridge fence. Uh, what, what do you think about that? And usually they'll come out and meet you at, at your property wow. too. So, and, and it's, again, it's free, <laughs> you know, <laughs> especially when you tell that, that GAF rep, uh, you know, oh, well, uh, the Owens Corning rep uh, <laughs> is saying that we should use this. Both of those guys will meet you out there um, yeah. and give you the pros and cons. So I would recommend uh, going that route. Great. Thank you. 
Okay, so Becky, so we have Becky that is in the chat answering questions, so that's great to know, but we want to just ask the question again anyway, just because there might be a benefit for the other people that didn't hear, didn't hear the question. So on um, YouTube, we have Corinne Mesner. Do most roof contractors phase over a five-year span? We cannot financially afford to do it all at once. Five years, uh, probably not. <laughs> but a, two to three years uh, is, is probably more doable. Now, um, there are some options as part of that phasing where you might be able to lock in some pricing with uh, you know, a, a vendor for five years, um, but not necessarily have them do all of the work uh, within that period. Um, and so, I mean, that's something we deal with that on a, on a regular basis, uh, both with our apartment clients and the larger HOAs that we deal with. You know, most folks are shorter on cash. Uh, and so, you know, we could, we could look at that and kind of help you vet, um, you know, some options. And then, like I say, even prioritize, you know, those roofs to try and help get you through, um, you know, that project over the course of the next five years. <clears throat> Great. And yeah, and I like that whole idea of taking a look at it, you know, bird's eye view, getting the thermal uh, image of that and seeing what really needs to be done. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. All right. And here for, on YouTube, we have Diane. And if you're on, if you are watching on the AOA website, um, I failed to mention it, but at the bottom right side, there is a, uh, a little help button. You can put your question in there and uh, that will make it to us. And so, yeah, here we go, keep going. And on YouTube as well, just ask a question, we'll get it to us. Um, Diane, you spoke of the possibility of paper under stucco being damaged. Can you elaborate under what type of circumstances that that would happen? Sure, so, you know, um, Back in the 70s, and it lasted until early 80s, um, you know, contractors were using an accelerant uh, in the stucco so to try and shorten the cure time so you could paint the buildings faster. Um, it, there's, there's still accelerants used today, uh, and because you want to get the pH in that uh, stucco down to a certain level so when you paint it, your, your paint adheres. Um, what we saw a lot of is there was an accelerant that was being used that actually ate away the building paper. So the building paper behind stucco is doing the same thing that the building paper under your sloped roof should be doing. So that's your primary uh, defense against moisture. And so in some of those older buildings, you know, they put this accelerant in the stucco, which goes over the paper and it ate away the paper and no one, you wouldn't know it unless you pulled all the stucco off. And so, um, you know, that's something that, especially on those parapet walls, um, you know, we want to be cognizant of. And, and we've chased a lot of water over the years where everyone thought, oh, our roofs are leaking, our roofs are leaking because water's coming in through our windows um, or our sliding glass doors. And at the end of the day, we found sometimes it's kind of a combination of things, but, you know, we had a lot of water making its way through that stucco and then running down the vertical surface. Mm -hmm. So. Um, there are inexpensive, um, you know, solutions to that now that we're utilizing, you know, the old fashioned way of doing it was all the stucco has to be pulled off. We repaper it and we restucco it and we repaint it, which is costly. Um, mm -hmm. And so there are some uh, paint products out there um, now that, you know, we'll spec if we're doing a, a roof that has a three foot parapet um, to try and coat that other side to at least prevent water from getting into our brand new roof, uh, you know, and then maybe we couple that with, uh, you know, a full paint job or a partial paint job, um, you know, if that's what the property calls for. But yeah, that's what we say. And especially if you, if you've got a parapet or a flat surface on any of your buildings and there's no metal coping over that and it's just stucco, I will bet you really good money that the paper underneath that uh, is damaged um, because the way that those guys even still today do it, uh, you know, they'll, they put the paper over it and then they put a bunch of nails in it and then they stuck over it. <laughs> so it's really just Swiss cheese underneath there. 
Um, yeah. so we'll want to try and cap it or even just use a coating, like I'd mentioned, to at least mitigate that uh, water intrusion. Great, here we are. All right, and we have another from YouTube from Brendan. Do you do inspections and come up with what we need if we have multiple properties? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. great. Okay. And then here, we'll just, we're gonna turbo through here. Sure. Um, keep asking questions on YouTube. We have James. Can you let me know more details on how to get a thermal scan done? And yep. So the way that we uh, do that is uh, we just we need the address uh, of the property so that we can figure out the square footage and um, and make sure we can fly. There are a few uh, no fly zones, um, you know, <laughs> in California. We've we've got uh, uh, licensed pilots um, on staff for that. So. Uh, and then once we we take a look at all of that, then we can kick out a, a proposal uh, to do the thermal scan. And then we also get up on those roofs when we do a th thermal scan to confirm, uh, you know, some of the conditions that uh, the thermal technology is has given us. Great. Here's ANSA management. Uh, what is the best value to deal with dips on a flat roof? Dips. Oh, so like low, uh, maybe where water's being caught. Mm -hmm. So again, depending on the age of the roof um, and how close you are to needing a re-roof or not, uh, you know, there are, there are uh, products out there where we can do a coating and fill in some of those low points. Um, depending on the number of, uh, you know, low points, have, you know, we might just end up doing, you know, some larger patches in that. Uh, I would say, you know, if it's, if it's a newer roof, well, I want to go back to the roofer <laughs> and ask why we've got that. And, and that said, you know, holding some ponding water isn't necessarily a horrible thing. Um, you know, but if you have ponding water and it's still there a week after a rain event, it's something we probably want to look at. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to, to give a blanket answer um, to that since it depends on the age of the roof, the type of roof. PVC and TPO can hold water um, for a lot longer than an older modified bitumen uh, roof. Um, so we would just really need to kind of look at that. You're welcome to email some photos uh, to Becky and you know we can give you our two cents. Great. And here's Lou again. Many of the larger flat roofs are getting foam. And so he's just wondering if you suggest doing a foam. Product. Yeah, so um, I, I'm not, Sure, exactly. Um, I think what you're talking about with foam is putting foam insulation down before a re-roof happens. So mm -hmm. I had mentioned uh, being really careful about the breathability if we're putting a TPO or PVC roof down. And insulation is one of the primary ingredients in doing that correctly. Uh, and so, you know, you just want to make sure that the foam thickness um, is correct. And you can a lot of times get your sloping um, proper sloping done in that foam as well, which is great. Um, and so, yeah, that's one of the first things you're going to want to do in addition to some venting um, to make sure that that roof that you're putting down lasts as long as it should. And again, I would get the manufacturer, you know, if a firm like ours isn't involved, get the manufacturer involved. Uh, you know, if your roofer is specking a Owens Corning or GAF, whatever it is, call that manufacturer say, hey, look, my roofer is specking your product and he's also specking two inches of foam underneath this. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts? And, and get them to email you their thoughts. <laughs> if they're not gonna- well, in, in writing, huh? Exactly, exactly. Writing. <laughs> yeah, That you way, two years from now, you're not like, well, I talked to a rep and he's- right. <laughs> <laughs> That'll hold up in court, won't it? <laughs> Yeah, can you, can you tell I've got quite the history and construction defect? Uh, <laughs> so I've been through enough cases over the last 15 years helping folks, uh, you know, where, where um, uh, construction projects were not done properly that have kind of seen it all. Mm -hmm. Here we have Brianna in Los Angeles from the chat. Are all coatings the same? And which brand do you recommend? Yeah, no, not at all. Um, and it's because some of them, similar to TPO and PVC, they look almost identical, but you've got acrylic coatings, you have silicone coatings, you've got coatings that have uh, insulation, uh, you know, kind of mixed in with it. 
And so, and they all have the pros and cons um, and it just depends on the application, you know? So it'll be one type of coating. If, you, if we're going over, let's say a lightweight concrete deck, um, you know, up on your roof, a different type if it's a wood substrate, uh, a different type if you've got a helipad. Uh, I mean, it's, <laughs> it really is just, there's a, so short answer, uh, no, they're not uh, uh, the, the same. <laughs> right. And be careful because certain ones can cause issues. You know, you, you put the wrong type of coating down and it, it looks great, um, mm -hmm. you know, but fast forward a few years and you might have uh, unintentionally, you know, caused, uh, caused an issue there. Great. And here we have James on YouTube. We have four drains in the middle of our flat roof that, that drain into pipes that take the water out off of the roof. How best to repair leaks around those drains? Yeah, so usually, I mean, we see those drain assemblies fail uh, quite often, just rust and over the years, debris and that sort of thing. So I would recommend, uh, one, we wanna make sure that they're draining properly because um, that's another thing that we'll see if you don't have proper slope in the drain going from the drain to wherever that leads to. Um, but so you usually wanna replace that whole drain assembly which means properly tying that back into, uh, you know, your roof uh, to prevent, because just band-aiding it with <laughs> silicone or Henry's or all the different things that we see uh, is usually just a really short-term uh, um, solution and you'll end up with more leaks. So you'll spend, up, spend more money on dry out and headache than just kind of replacing that whole uh, body. But again, it's, these are things that it's a lot easier for us to, to make a solid recommendation once we've, you know, gotten our eyes on it. Mm -hmm. And one thing that you and I were, were talking about uh, before the live stream went live was the, um, the terms and conditions on the, on the warranties. Mm -hmm. And just kind of curious, what's one of the, what's one of the things in there that you like to change um, well, before so you get started? Yeah, one of the biggest things that we, we will do is first make sure that we've got the manufacturer's buy-in on whatever system we're putting down. And then we ask from the manufacturer, okay, what do we need to do to get the warranty that we're paying for? Uh, you know, because most of the folks that are on here now probably know, you know, oh, it might come with a standard 10-year or 20-year, but for X dollars more, you can get a 30-year or whatever. So, so what do we want? What are we paying for? And we turn around and make sure that all of that goes into the contractor's contract and is tied to their pay application. So, you know, if we need to call out the manufacturer once the primer coat has gone down for sign off. Uh, well, that needs to happen before we pay you, uh, you know, in this pay application. If, if it didn't happen, guess what? Uh, you know, the manufacturer is coming back out and you might have to redo you know, 2000 square feet or more. We've had some roofers that were unpleasantly surprised at what they had to redo because the manufacturer was gonna say, look, you didn't call me out when you were supposed to. So I'm not gonna sign off on this. So, you know, we, we, we found the best way to do it is hold the contractor's feet to the fire through their contract. That really just reflects what the manufacturer wants to see and put the onus on that roofer to say, look, you are the one that has to call out the manufacturer before you move to this next stage. And if you don't, you're not getting paid. Mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously all the way through to where we get final sign off at the end. Um, and we get that uh, warranty certificate from the manufacturer. Great. Yeah. I, I was... It doesn't even add cost. That doesn't add cost to your. Right. Right. <laughs> There's no cost to that. Yep. And I was just, I was shocked when you said that 95% of warranties do not get a payout because they didn't do things like that. And so just for our members, I really wanted them to hear that. And I hope everybody stuck with us to the end to be able to hear that um, from you, just how, how the, you have to really work with the manufacturer and let them see everything. So thank you so much for sharing. Really appreciate it. And your information should be flashed up on the screen so that they know how to get a hold of you and, and your website. And, um, Anyway, just wanted to wrap out. Don't wrap up here and just say, don't, don't forget to subscribe to our e-newsletter. You can write us at uh, membership at aoausa.com. 
and just give us your name and your zip code and we can, we can get you on the e-news uh, update list. And you can also just subscribe. If you're going down on our webpage, go to the bottom on that right side, you can subscribe there. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and um, catch more of these tips. Man, I, I, this, is, this is one where it, everybody has a roof and so everybody mm -hmm. needs to hear it. And hopefully we'll get a lot of people that catch this after everything's over, after the fact. And then also I wanna remind you that on November 19th, we have an eviction attorney that's gonna come in and we'll have a, he'll give a presentation, give us an update on what's happening um, with uh, evictions and he'll do a Q and A. And I know that that'll be really popular. That'll be with Dennis Block on November 19th. So anyway, thank you very much everyone for, for watching this and for listening to Paul share. And uh, thank you, Paul, for every, the expertise that you provided and AD Magellan and everything that you guys are doing. It's great um, to have, to know that there's these kind of companies around and um, just so that things can be just and right and uh, not get, not spend all this money on a warranty that you don't even get to uh, uh, receive any benefit from. So again, thank you so much and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for having us. Really appreciate it. Cheers. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.